The University of California Master Gardener program extends research-based information about home horticulture and pest management to the public. On behalf of the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County, I'd like to welcome you to part seven of our eight part series, Successful Vegetable Gardening, Growing Year Round in Santa Clara County. My name is Sharon Erickson. I'm a volunteer with the Master Gardener program here in Santa Clara County and I'll be your moderator for tonight's session. First, the disclaimer. Um, this course is geared towards residents of Santa Clara County, California, where we have warm, dry summers and cool, but not cold, wet winters that allow us to grow vegetables year round. If you're from another area, you may find that some of our material may not apply directly to you. Planting times, local soil and climate conditions, and common local pests may be different in your area. If so, there are master gardener programs um, all over the US and Canada that can provide advice appropriate to where you live. On the other hand, much of what we're saying tonight is true for vegetable gardeners everywhere. So we hope everyone listening gets a lot out of this course. This eight part series began with a session on garden planning, followed by sessions on soil, seeds and seedlings, water and mulch, managing pests and cool season vegetables. Tonight's session is the first of two sessions on warm season vegetables. Your presenter tonight is Candace Simpson. Candace, who spoke last week on cool season vegetables and before that on soil, has been a UC Master Gardener volunteer since I believe 2003. Take it away, Candace. Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for coming back and joining us again. Uh, yes, last week we talked about cool season vegetables and we mentioned that some of them can be grown through the summer. But most of us really enjoy shifting our garden space over to grow the crops that are really well suited to the kind of summer we hear have here in Santa Clara County. And uh, uh, I put this picture up again, I showed it to you last, last time, um, but I put it up again to remind you of the kinds of things that we can grow in the summer. These are, if you'll notice, um, this is one day's harvest from about uh, 200 square feet of gardening space. These are all fruits. Last, when we were talking about cool season crops, we mentioned that they were mostly leaves, roots, shoots, uh, stems, flower buds, et cetera, not very many fruits. But in the summer, most of what we go grow are fr the fruits of the plants. The exception are, is that pile of beans that you see toward the back right of this picture. Uh, that is the fruit of the bean plant. And there are a couple of beet, beets that squeezed into this picture too there in the front row. Uh, but Growing up, for a plant to grow to its fruit, to get all the way to producing a, a fruit, is a requires a tremendous amount of energy and material. So these are very heavy feeding plants in general, and they require lots of sunlight and warmth, and uh, of course, fertilizer and water in order to be successful. So this is a intense time in the garden. Okay, I'm not sure why. All right, so I wanted to start by just mentioning a few things that you need to do in order to get ready for the summer garden. If you grew a cover crop, you need to dig that in about four weeks ahead of the time that you intend to start planting. And most of us now are thinking about planting, starting the planting of our summer garden around May 1st. Not everything will go in then. If you listen carefully tonight, you'll hear some different uh, timelines for certain vegetables, but uh, some of the vegetables can start going in around May 1st. So if you still have a cover crop in, uh, get busy digging that in. If you don't know how to do that, I refer you back to the um, soils class, class number two. Clean up the weeds, the old mulch, the spent plants, um, all those kinds of things. Now, uh, old mulch can sometimes be used again. If it's straw and it's still fairly clean, you may be able to use it again. However, 
insects, uh, insect pests do overwinter in the garden sometimes in the material that's left on the garden beds. So this is why we say clean up um, because you want to you want to do that so that you remove some of those pests and they don't can't just get on the next season's plants. Loosen the soil, add compost and fertilizer. And if you have questions about how much or what to, how to do that, back to class two where we talked about that in detail. Reduce weeds. We talked about that in class two also, and then we talked about weeds uh, more in another class. Check and repair your irrigation system. This is checking if you have a drip system to make sure that everything's dripping rather than flowing too, too much or too little. Um, re, uh, check your battery. If you have a timer out there, uh, make sure everything is going to function well. Gather any plant supports that you are going to use because those need to be put in place at the time of planting. Uh, there's nothing, uh, well, there are some other things that are worse, but uh, it's not fun to try to lever a big cage over a tomato plant and break a major branch of that tomato plant. So they need to put, be put in when you plant. And also have available whatever it is you plan to use, if there's anything you're going to use for pest protection. If you're going to use any of the things that we showed you in the IPM class, uh, either row cover or uh, netting or uh, hardware cloth cages, you want to be sure those are ready to go. These plants have to be protected from day one. And then, of course, gather your seeds and seedlings and uh, labels for everything that you plan to put into the garden. Here's another thing that's very sad. That is growing a tomato that you think is the best one you ever tasted and then not remembering what variety it was. So uh, we have some tips for you about placing labels in the garden as we go through this class, but do have labels for everything that you're going to put in there. Okay, so we're gonna jump right in with the queen of the summer tomatoes, uh, uh, the summer vegetables, and that is the tomato. And uh, this is just a spectacular picture of all the uh, various kinds of tomatoes. Probably most of these are heirlooms. Um, because they do tend to be the ones that have these interesting uh, color combinations and so forth. Tomatoes can be sort of a black hole. We can get into tomatoes and spend, we could spend hours and hours on it. So this is going to go by pretty quickly. If you did the homework assignment, you saw how many different insects diseases and environmental challenges there are for tomatoes. Uh, and I, I hope that you were able to look at that. Uh, we are only going to be able to mention the most commonly encountered pests or diseases tonight, and even that's going to have to be pretty, we're going to have to go over that pretty quickly. Our hope is that by now you know how to go straight to that IPM, the UC IPM site and use that information to help you take care of your garden. So here's a, we, it does look like we're looking at a drought situation here again, um, unless we have some kind of miracle here in April. So we are going to all have to be trying to minimize water use in our gardens. And yet there are no drought tolerant vegetables. And if you don't uh, give them enough water to thrive, you will have wasted whatever water you do give them. So one drought tip is that it, you might want this year choose to grow smaller varieties or earlier producing varieties. That kind of information is available on, on the web in many places, and you can make that deliberate choice in order to be using less water in your garden. This is always also good advice for people whose gardens are a little bit on the cool side. That being said, there are hundreds of varieties for you to choose from, and taste is very personal. So, um, please don't start putting questions in the chat about what is that pink and green striped tomato at the bottom of the picture. Uh, you can do that kind of research yourself on the web and we won't have time to answer all those. Even if we knew the answers, we won't have time to answer those kinds of questions tonight. Our website, even though we cannot have a spring garden market this year, our Master Gardener website for Santa Clara County does list most, if not all, of the varieties that we typically sell there with descriptions. So that's one place that you can go to our website to 
read about different varieties and see if they sound like something that you might want. So there are all these amazing heirlooms uh, and there are a lot of open pollinated plants that are not particularly regarded as heirlooms. And there are many hybrid varieties also that you can grow. So there are just hundreds and hundreds of tomato varieties that you can choose from. Uh, an important thing, uh, oh, well, here are just the four major types of tomato fruit. So this, is, this will help you if you're not familiar with these terms, this will help you when you're evaluating varieties, when you read about them. Up in the, the um, left-hand upper corner, we have classic, what we call classic tomatoes, uh, average sized tomatoes, medium sized tomatoes, uh, to kind of big, uh, they can get kind of big. Um, and um, they are usually round and usually red, but um, not always. That's a classic. On the upper right, you see plum tomatoes, which are typically used more for cooking and sauces, but they're also very nice as a salad tomato. And they tend to have this uh, oval elongated shape and they're smaller than classics generally, but there are exceptions to everything that I'm saying. And then on the lower left, the cherry tomato, which I think everybody is familiar with, comes in all the colors of the rainbow these days. And uh, all the tomatoes are small, the plants are not small. They're full-size tomato plants. And on the right, a whopper of a beef steak tomato. You can see how very big that is. Um, these can be um, up to two pounds, maybe, probably some of you have raised some that are even larger than that. And they have a particular kind of shape uh, that you see there as well. Not, a, not a, just a really regular um, round shape. They're probably a fusion of more than one fruit, which is why they have that shape. So those are the different kinds of tomatoes that you might be considering. No matter what you grow, uh, my first piece of advice to you is to set a regular watering schedule and stick to it. Uh, tomatoes, you were, you were told in the IPM class that there are a number of conditions that tomatoes can be subject to that are caused by irregular watering. And a tomato plant is, a, is we're gonna talk about size in a minute, and we do have some smaller ones, some larger ones, but all of them, they, they are a pretty big plant and they're putting on a lot of fruit. So they need regular water. If you have heard that you can intensify the flavor of tomatoes by cutting the water to them, that is true. And you can do that, but reduce the water once the tomatoes are full sized and starting to ripen. This is a bit of a problem with one whole uh, family of tomatoes that we call indeterminate tomatoes, which I will talk about in, in, on the next slide. But um, remember, don't reduce the water until the plant is really grown and is setting fruit, and preferably the, the fruit have sized up but are still green. When they start to ripen, when you start to see that color change, that's the time to cut that water back if you're trying to intensify the flavor be aware that the skins will toughen because, that, for, because of that. So if you're, you're gonna have a trade off there. When do you, some people always ask when, how do you know when to harvest? Well, they should be fully colored, which means you have to know the color that the fruit is intended to be because there are some tomatoes that are green tomatoes when they are ripe. So you need to look that up and know what color it's supposed to be. And they should be softening a little bit when you actually, you know, take that tomato in your hand on the vine, you, you should be able to, it shouldn't feel like a rock or a softball. You should be able to squeeze that tomato a little bit. Also know that you can always bring tomatoes in and they will continue to ripen on the counter. Not quite the same as fully ripened in the sun, but very acceptable for many purposes. Okay. Well, another idea, you can try more varieties if your garden is small um, or if you want to just try a tremendous number of varieties. You can do that by planting two varieties together in the same space. You will not get twice as much of a harvest from that. You will get the same size harvest, but you, it will be divided between the two varieties. So if having a lot of varieties is important to you, you can use that trick. 
because you do need to give tomatoes enough space. And that brings us to this idea of determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. So a determinate tomato, all tomatoes are sort of a vine. Um, they, they look like a bush, but they, they're actually kind of vining. Determinate tomatoes do not get very tall. So they stay more bush-like. They might get two to four feet tall. Um, that's probably the upper limit. Uh, and they tend to put their major crop on all at once so that many tomatoes are ripening at the same time. This is an advantage if you want to make large quantities of tomato sauce or you want to can or freeze or whatever, to have a lot of tomatoes ready at the same time so that you can preserve them. That kind of tomato plant, because it's shorter, uh, can be easily supported in uh, a smaller cage, like the cages that you see in garden centers now that are about four feet tall. An indeterminate tomato is never stops growing until frost kills it. So it keeps getting taller and taller and it will grow to the top. You see these six foot, six foot, six feet tall cages here on the right um, in this picture it will grow to the top of that cage and continue to grow and come all the way back down to the ground. Uh, they are vines and they will just keep doing that. And they will put their fruit on, they will set fruit successively. So you will, it will keep setting fruit as long as it is growing. That's why so many of us have at the end of the season when it's no longer warm enough to ripen those tomatoes outside, we still have tomatoes that are green on the plants because we have grown indeterminate plants. Indeterminate plants take very tall, uh, strong cages at, like the ones that you see here. And uh, so look for, look for these or make your own out of concrete reinforcing wire. There is something on our website that tells you how to make these cages, I believe. I'm pretty sure I saw it there one time. So you can make your own. Um, and 18 inches in diameter is enough, but up to 24 inches is fine. If you wanted to plant two tomatoes in the same cage for, for the purpose of having more varieties in your garden, you, could, you might like the, the larger diameter one. The, the difficulty with those are they are not collapsible. Uh, so you can search on the web to try to find collapsible uh, tomato cages that are more easily stored. Okay, how do you plant these, these plants? M most of you may be raising your tomatoes, congratulations, uh, or buying them in nurseries. And uh, tomatoes are the one plant that we can plant really deep. So you can actually plant them up to the top leaves that are showing. And that's what's shown here in this picture. Uh, dig a deep hole, pinch off the leaves that are gonna be low, below the soil. That's not really necessary, but you can do that. And then put it down in that deep hole and bury it right up to uh, the, where those leaves are that are, are um, above the ground level. Uh, it will grow roots all along that buried stem. Most plants and most vegetable plants will not do that. So remember, this is only a technique for tomatoes. We have a video on our website that shows um, Karen doing this. Um, and so you can uh, watch that video if you're uh, unsure about the details of how to do this. And that video also shows uh, how to do trench planting. So you can, if you have a very tall spindly seedling um, maybe you grew it inside and not under lights, and so it got very stretched out. Um, so you don't want that tall, uh, skinny uh, plant to be planted uh, with all of that above ground. So you want to plant it below ground. But if you've grown a very large seedling, sometimes I grow my seedlings into gallon cans, and I could have to dig a three foot deep hole to get that tomato buried up to the top leaves. So you can, in a case like that, plant it in a trench. And the video on, the, on our website also shows trench planting. But basically you dig a sloping trench 
you put the root ball down in the deeper part of the trench and just lay the stem along that sloping ramp-like trench so that the leaves come out uh, at a distance away from the root ball. And you need to mark the root ball so that you don't accidentally plant something else on top of it. And uh, you, the leaves will tell you where the plant is actually going to grow. So you have to think in your mind, where am I going to put my cage? You wanna put it over the leaves of the plant even though the root ball may be someplace else. So watch that video if you're interested in trying this kind of planting. Uh, the, the picture in the slide shows you, I dug one up one year. I plant, I, I grow these very tall seedlings and I dug one up to see what the roots were like. And you can see all that root mass that has grown all along that buried stem. So it's, a, it's tomato plants are amazing. Nothing can stop them from growing their roots. Okay. So this is a, a picture that you were shown, I, at least some of these were shown in the IPM class and I just wanted to mention them quickly again. These are some of the environmental disorders of tomatoes that are very common, uh, especially the two at the top, but really all of them. Uh, and they are uh, the, the sun scald, the blossom end rot and the cracking all have something to do with the way you are watering your tomatoes. So some varieties are more susceptible to blossom end rot or cracking, um, but you can really help prevent these particular conditions from developing. They're not diseases, they're not pests, uh, by making sure you have that regular sufficient water to your tomatoes. Uh, the sun scald happens because there are not enough leaves on the plant to protect the fruit when they start to form. And that's something that's going to happen if you're not watering the plant enough. Blossom end rot happens because some nutrient um, uh, um, problems occur because of in, in irregular watering. And cracking is just a matter of irregular watering. Cat facing is a little bit different, has to do with conditions. You've probably seen uh, tomatoes like that. There's not much that you can do to prevent cat facing if you have a a variety that's susceptible. Um, some beef steaks are particularly susceptible to that. Okay. All right. These, these are two diseases that I do wanna spend a little bit of time on here because these are very common. Um, these are um, showing two types of fungal diseases, verticillium and fusarium. They are both fungi that live in our soil. And our soils here have them. If you don't have never seen this in your garden, count yourself as a very lucky gardener. Uh, they are, are fungi that live in the soil and then move into the vascular system of susceptible plants and clog the vascular system. So the vascular system is what transports materials through the plant. And in particular, in this case, transports water from the roots up into the plant. So if that becomes clogged or any part of it becomes clogged, the part of the plant that is served by that part of the system will just look like it's not being watered. And so people may, you may be putting more water on it. I don't, maybe it's not getting enough water, but that's not going to help because the, the system that delivers the water is clogged. So um, this is a, um, a very disappointing thing to have happen to your tomatoes, but there are a, a, a couple of things. First of all, it's very difficult to tell these two diseases apart by looking at the plant. Um, in fact, you can't do it. Um, I will tell you a way to tell if you had verticillium, what you're looking for if you look on verticillium is just die back in some part of the plant. Like maybe one random branch suddenly dies back because the vascular system serving that branch is what got clogged first. Um, it's often on one side because the vascular system, there's more than one of these uh, tubules that's going up there. So you can see the, the verticillium picture is um, on one side. So if you suspect that you have verticillium or fusarium, this is going to keep progressing. There's nothing you can do to stop it. 
because if the organism is in your soil and your plant is susceptible, then um, the, the disease is going, to, um, is going to take over that plant. And there's nothing that can, we can do to stop it or cure it. There's no spraying. Remember, it's something that's coming in from the soil and clogging the vascular system. So what you have to decide is whether you're going to hope to get a few tomatoes out of these plants before they get so bad that they can't protect them uh, from sunburn and so forth. And, they, and then they can't feed them anymore to get them to a decent size and a decent um, sweetness. Uh, so you have to decide, am I gonna try to do that or am I gonna take this plant out? Now you might say, why would I decide to take it out early? At least I might get a couple of tomatoes. The longer that plant is in the ground, the more you are basically giving that disease organism a place to proliferate. So you are, you are going to increase the amount of that disease organism that is in your garden, in the soil by doing that. Um, I won't say that I have never say it, tried to keep a plant going. I, I always keep them going for a while to see how uh, heavy that seems to be. But um, it, it's uh, not, you, you now know what the argument is, would be for taking it, taking it out early. When you are finally done with that plant, I highly recommend that you get in the habit of, when you're gonna take it out, cut through a cross section low on the plant and look at it and you will see this kind of discoloration if in fact you did have verticillium. Uh, fusarium looks similar, but it tends to be darker and I have never had fusarium in my garden, but I have verticillium to some extent every year. And I make a decision based on how bad that cross section looks about whether I will plant tomatoes in the garden in that same place the next year. So the things that we can do are, this is why you get that advice, don't plant tomatoes in the same place one year after another. It's because by doing that, if there's verticillium in the soil, it is going to be building up as long as there's a susceptible plant. If there is no susceptible plant there, it will die back down to a lower level in your soil and you may be able to get tomatoes past it in a year or two or three. Generally, it never goes away entirely, so it's always going to come back, but you can get, a, if you are willing to not plant tomatoes in that place for two or three or maybe four years, you may get that disease down to the point where you can get tomatoes to uh, be healthy and survive for a season. So uh, just keep that in mind. The other thing that you can do if you have this disease in your garden and it is affecting all your tomatoes is grow hybrid varieties that have been bred to uh, not be susceptible to this disease. When you look on the plant tags of tomatoes that you buy in, um, in a nursery, you will see a bunch of letters there sometimes if it's a hybrid plant. It might have a V, it might have say VFTM, V stands for verticillium, and that means this plant doesn't get verticillium. F stands for fusarium, and that means this plant doesn't get fusarium. So if you've had a bad year, you can go with hybrids. It's a very good reason for trying hybrids. You can also move your tomatoes into containers for a year. I'm saying these things because most of us don't have room in our garden uh, to move tomatoes, a sunny, nice sunny prime space, to have tomatoes moving around in different places in the garden. Uh, so these are some other things that you can use. Plant hybrids for a year, move into containers for another year. Now you've had two years without tomatoes in that, in that difficult spot, and maybe you're, you're ready to try it again. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk now about a couple of insects that you might see in the garden. Uh, this one is russet mite and um, I, we talk about this one. Most, most insects, tomato plants grow so fast and so big that they don't cause much trouble, but this one can be terrible. It is a mite. It's even smaller than spider mites. It's different from spider mites. It doesn't web, doesn't make webs. 
um, but it's even smaller. So you are not going to see it with the naked eye. You, it's even difficult to see it with a 10 uh, magnification loop. Uh, you need a 30 magnification loop really to see it. But they overwinter in the soil. And if you plant, uh, if you had a, a, a plant that had this kind of browning all over, this is not like verticillium or fusarium. It doesn't start in spotty places and then get worse. This starts at the ground level and moves inexorably up the plant, turning the stems and the leaves this russety brown. And uh, it's the mites that have coming out of the soil from the previous year or have somehow gotten to your garden this year. And they are climbing up your plant and sucking the juices out of your plant. And in the process, um, they are uh, dehydrating the leaves. And on the stems, basically their feces is discoloring the stems. So you can see those black dots, that's, that's feces on the, from the mites. And um, so this is what russet mite damage looks like in the early stages. And this is what it looks like in the late stages. So if you do nothing to stop them, they will completely um, dehydrate your plant. And now you will have, even if there are a lot of tomatoes on there, you will have tomatoes that are fully exposed to sun and sunburn. So um, this is an insect that if you, if you see this kind of browning starting, thoroughly at the bottom and slowly moving up the plant, you want to treat as quickly as you can. And it is treatable and can completely controllable with sulfur. Uh, sulfur, what you want is something called um, wettable sulfur. It is not soil sulfur, which is what we put in our soil to change the pH of our soil. It is an insecticidal sulfur. It's the same material, but it's formulated differently. So a wettable sulfur. And you can mix that into water and spray it uh, following the directions. I'm not gonna go into the details here, but follow the directions carefully on the package and, and start early. When you, when you think that you, the description fits russet mite, you can try to have our help desk confirm that for you by looking at pictures of your plant spray right away and spray two weeks later. And if you thoroughly spray your plant, and it is one of those things where you have to get the upside and the downside of the leaves, everything has to be covered. But remember, you're going to be doing this before your, your plants are full size. So it's, it's doable and it does work. So um, try to remember that trick in case you do get a russet mite. Here's another um, insect that you might see, but this uh, most of us don't have very many of these, if any, in our garden. If you have lots of them, they can do a lot of damage. Uh, the, these are actually two species of hornworm, to me, uh, tobacco hornworm uh, up top and vegetable hornworm, hornworm down below. The one down below with all those white things on it is actually uh, has been parasitized by a um, by an insect that um, lays its eggs in the hornworm. And when the larvae are ready to pupate, it's a wasp, when the larvae are ready to pupate, they come out and they pupate on the outside of the caterpillar. So um, if you see these, they're huge, they get to four inches. And if you see large, droppings uh, about the size of a pea, half a pea, in your uh, large black droppings around on the leaves of your tomato plant or on the ground, look up above that and you'll probably find one of these guys. Uh, they're uh, terrifying if you just come eye to, you know, nose to nose with them when you're picking tomatoes, but uh, they're just a caterpillar. And if you see one that's been parasitized like this picture below, Take it away from your tomato plant, but it's not eating anymore. You can see how sick that one looks. It's shriveling and it's going to die from this parasitized uh, experience. So you can take it off your tomato plant if you want, but put it someplace in your garden where it can uh, live until all those wasps come out because they are going to parasitize future uh, hornworms and save other tomato plants. 
um, this is our first mention of a virus tonight, but we do have some viruses that affect other vegetables as well. So remember what I say about these here. There are viruses that infect plants. Many of them are benign. If you have a variegated plant in your garden, it's variegated because it is infected, so to speak, with a benign virus that makes these strange color uh, changes in the, in the foliage. Uh, but there are disease causing viruses. Uh, and here, these are pictures of uh, tomato leaves that have been affected by the tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, the tomato family, the Solanaceae family is, is large and tobacco is in it. And so this tobacco mosaic virus does affect tomatoes and peppers um, as well as tobacco. And uh, you can see some of the classic symptoms of virus here. The thready, uh, strange looking leaves up above that don't look anything like tomato leaves that are, are supposed to look. Uh, that is one thing that can happen from a virus. The kind of uh, crumpled, uh, strange looking puckered and color variation leaves that you see down below on the tomato plant. Um, are another thing that happens with a virus. So this is gonna be general uh, advice for any vegetable. If you see very strange color variations or patterns, and I'll show you some others tonight, um, in the leaves, uh, that is probably, that may indicate that your plant is infected with a virus. Now you need to be very clear about what your variety is supposed to look like. Um, but I'll show you some on um, beans and on peppers later as well, um, so that you can kind of get this idea that these weird looking leaves are not benign. Uh, they may harbor a virus. Uh, Louise mentioned viruses that infect plants and there is very little you can do. When a plant is uh, known to be infected with a virus, you should really remove it from your garden as she advised as soon as you recognize that. Because many viruses, not this one, not tobacco mosaic, but many viruses are spread by insects, sucking insects that um, take the juices from an infected plant and transfer it to a plant that previously was not infected. So if you allow a virus ridden plant to stand in your garden, you are just creating a reservoir of virus that can be ultimately can infect your other plants. So as soon as you have concluded, and again, use our help desk to help you with this, send them pictures and they will advise you. Uh, as soon as you have, have reasonable, you're, it's reasonable to believe it's a virus, you should remove it from your garden there's nothing you can do to save it. I mentioned tobacco mosaic virus is not spread by insects. So then how is it spread? How does it get into our gardens? Mainly by being carried in by people who use tobacco products because tobacco is very, very commonly infected with this virus. And so the tobacco that is in tobacco products used by people uh, is very likely to be infected and simply handling, it's not from the smoke, it's not smoking a cigarette in the garden, it's having handled a cigarette and then going in and touching the plants. Here is another virus uh, that has shown up in the last few years in our uh, area. It was not, it's been a serious problem on the East Coast, Southeast for quite some time. And there are some hybrid varieties that are um, resistant to it. It's tomato spotted wilt virus. And if, you, if a variety in a nursery is resistant, the tag will say TSWV, TSWV, tomato spotted wilt virus. So I don't think there's any way you could assume that these were normal tomatoes if you saw these on a plant in your garden you see how different this looks from the pretty things that we looked at before uh, in, the, in the picture of the heirlooms. So it, it is uh, these circular patterns, raised areas, green tomatoes you see in the upper left, uh, get these raised um, circular-ish uh, bumps 
uh, and then it develops these color patterns. So this, this is a good example. These are three different examples of how those patterns might look. So they're not all the same, um, but they're uh, really quite dramatic. And if you see anything like this on your tomatoes, you need to remove that um, plant immediately. Um, these viruses are spread by insects. Uh, so it, people always ask about composting. Uh, I think most of us, if we saw something like this in our garden, we would wanna put it in the city compost, not in our own compost. And the city compost is so hot that it will definitely destroy this. You don't have to, the city compost is an amazing product. It's a good product. Um, you can feel confident using it in your gardens. It does not have diseases. Even if people put things like this in it, it will not have diseases because it is so hot and it is so well managed, constantly turned uh, so that every single bit of what's in that pile uh, is exposed to high heat for long enough to kill everything that might cause a problem in your garden. We can't usually say the same about our home compost piles. So unless you have a reliably very hot compost pile, it gets up to 160 degrees, stays there for several days, uh, you probably wanna put anything like this into the city compost. The picture of the foliage I just put there because there are a lot of things that affect um, tomato leaves that um, make them go brown and patchy like this. So it's probably harder to recognize this disease by leaf symptoms than it is by fruit symptoms. Um, and I just said uh, one more word about it because um, we talk to you a lot about weeds and controlling weeds. These are three weeds that are very common in our, and you can take look at these pictures while I'm talking and, and I hope that you will recognize them if you let them get big enough to look like this. Uh, the cheese weed picture is rather small, but you can see the cotyledon there, that little heart-shaped cotyledon is very characteristic of cheese weed. All three of these weeds are alternate hosts for tomato spotted wilt virus and thrips. Thrips is the insect that spreads this disease. So it feeds on infected plants and then moves to uninfected plants and transfers the virus to uninfected plants. So, and it, thrips are extremely hard to control. They're very, very, very tiny. Don't have time to talk about them too much tonight, but you can look them up on the IPM page and read about them. They are ubiquitous in our gardens. There is not a garden that doesn't have thrips. And the Western flower thrips is one of the most common and that is the insect that spreads this disease. And they live on these weeds when there aren't plants in your garden that they want to live on. Uh, and these weeds can harbor the virus. And because the insects can live on them too, it's a sure way to get the virus into your garden. So yet another reason to keep weeds out of your vegetable garden. I did wanna show you this picture because having shown you those pictures of those spotty tomatoes, um, I want you to take a good look at this tomato because this is not spotted wilt virus. This is stink bug damage. And I'm going to talk about stink bugs later when I talk about beans because they're a pest on beans. But as you can see here, they also sting fruits. So a stink bug is a sucking insect and it sticks its mouth part into uh, the, a fruit and uh, sucks out some of the material. That's how it feeds. And when it does that, it creates these kind of cloudy patches. So take a good look at that and think of the ways in which that seemed to be different from these, okay? The one that you might worry about is the one on the upper right, but even there you can see it's a very different kind of pattern than here. So um, stink bug damage is irritating, but it is just an insect having a little taste of your beautiful tomato 
and uh, it's not anything that will keep you from eating the tomato if you don't like that part of it or if there's damage inside, you can cut that off and eat the rest of the tomato. We'll talk about stink bugs later. And here is another insect that I wanted to put in because uh, you may see them and um, they are uh, spectacular to see. On the right, you see the adult, and that is a, that's a pomegranate that it's sitting on. It, it's two favorite foods in the garden are pomegranates and tomatoes. And they seem to like big round red things, I think. Uh, the adult that you see there on the right is a large insect. It's, uh, you know, almost, it's three quarters of an inch to an inch. It's big, so you can't miss it. The ones, the little red ones on the left, crawling all over those tomatoes, are the, uh, the nymphs, the just hatched out of the egg size. So they're small, those are kind of the beginning tomatoes. Um, they're about maybe a quarter of an inch to a, a, a larger in stars might be like a half an inch. Um, but um, they, you know, they molt and go through a number of stages and get bigger and eventually turn into this uh, guy that you see on the right. Um, Again, their damage, they're also sucking insects. And their damage to tomatoes or pomegranates, they, they might, they're after the adults are after the seeds. The nymphs are just, so that's why they like tomatoes and pomegranates, actually not big red things. Uh, they're going to try to get their, their proboscis, their feeding tube all the way into a seed and eat the material in the seed because the seed is where the protein is in this plant. So. Uh, that's what they're they're after. So they can cause some weirdness inside, but the rest of the 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 fruit is uh, anything that doesn't look strange is totally safe to eat. And um, you can try to um, uh, find the eggs. You can look that up on the website on our IBM website. See what the eggs look like. You can watch for these nymphs and just knock them to the ground and crush them, or vacuum them up in a vacuum cleaner that you keep just for the purpose of vacuuming up bugs, preferably, okay? Uh, you know, like a battery powered uh, vacuum cleaner that you can take out into the garden. And finally, uh, uh, rats. Uh, rats love tomatoes. And I swear that they, when I watch a tomato to see if it's ripening and when I'm gonna pick it, uh, rats are watching me and uh, they uh, go over and check the tomato after I've checked it. And the day I'm gonna pick it is the day I go out and I see this kind of damage. So you will know it's a rat if it's been very smoothly uh, kind of chewed out. They come back and they keep chewing and you know, with their little teeth and they just kind of carve out this nice little cave in there. Uh, and they will come back to a tomato like that night after night, actually, and finish the whole thing if you allow that to happen. So uh, rat uh, protection, protection against rats, if you know that they're there in your garden, uh, is essential if you don't want to have this kind of disappointment. They don't eat them when they're green. They wait until they're ripe. Okay. We are ready to move on to peppers. This is the same family. Tomatoes, peppers, eggplants are all in the same family. Um, and uh, these are also just amazing. These are gonna be some pretty pictures of all the beautiful colors and shapes that peppers come in. But again, in terms of varieties, you will find many varieties described on our website. Uh, please go there and look through that and uh, look at seed look in, at seed company websites and so forth. And uh, uh, Seed Savers uh, Exchange is a all heirlooms, wonderful um, organization that has a website that you can look at uh, many, many varieties of heirloom peppers if, if that's uh, your interest. So they come from, as you know, sweet to hot, uh, uh, all levels of heat. Uh, all shapes and sizes, they, have, they all start green and they change color as they move toward being ripe. Um, and many of them uh, end up red, uh, no matter whether they were yellow or orange along the way, they may end up red. 
Um, I didn't mention planting date, I think, for tomatoes. Um, we suggest that you wait till May 1st. Now, uh, Louise gave you some temperatures, but it's really hard to determine um, if, if we say not until nighttime temperatures are reliably above X. Well, they're never reliably above X in the Bay Area at least. And so, because we have so much variation um, in, in uh, it, it's not a, a interior place where we can count on the nights staying uh, warm. So uh, it's, we, we like to go with a date. Most of us go with a date. And for tomatoes, I go with May 1st. So it's on 99, I'm gonna say 90 out of 100 years, uh, it will be fine on May 1st. Uh, and it's only getting warmer. So uh, I think that's going to be fine. So that's a, a rule of thumb for you. If you live in a particularly cold area, maybe you wanna be a, a, a little more uh, conservative and put them out in the middle of May. Um, the, the fear is that if we have a late rain and it gets cool and we have a late rain, there are some fungal diseases that can seriously affect tomato plants in those, uh, in those conditions. And um, we don't usually have those fungal diseases here. Uh, because we wait until May to plant our tomatoes. So don't try putting them out. Uh, it's not how early you get them out that's gonna determine. You may even stunt them so that they don't perform well. So uh, hope you'll all take May 1 as a good day to plant your tomatoes. Peppers, however, need it to be even warmer. So peppers, I, my advice to you would be June 1st. Now, if you know your garden is hotter than at the average garden and you have a super protected garden and it's a, been a really hot year and everything is going for you and you wanna put them out earlier, um, that's what gardening's all about, isn't it? Experimenting and, and trying to push the envelope a little bit. But I put my peppers out on the first, first of June, unless I'm planting in containers. Containers warm up faster than the soil. And so it is um, uh, more justified to plant peppers or tomatoes or eggplants a little bit earlier than the June 1st deadline for peppers and eggplants uh, if you are planting into, in, into containers. Okay. Um, you do want to cage or stake most of your pepper plants. Now they are sturdier than tomato plants they, and they don't get as tall, at least most of them don't. Although there are pepper plants that will get just as tall as determinate tomatoes and maybe even challenge uh, some other tomato plants. Um, so you can look and see how big your, your uh, pepper is expected to get in terms of height. You can look that up on the web, um, but uh, they, most peppers benefit from being staked because those peppers, especially sweet bell peppers or large uh, sweet peppers, they weigh a lot and the branches aren't that sturdy. So that if you get a good crop, you they are at least gonna bend those uh, branches over if not uh, break them. So at, uh, putting a cage around them and small tomato cages work fine for this, the, the wire cages that are available. In the, um, in the garden centers are, are definitely fine for this. Um, but I, you plant and put the cage in place. I forgot to mention that. Um, I mentioned it in the summary at the beginning, but be sure when you plant your tomatoes that you put that cage in place when you plant the tomato and the same for the peppers. Put it over that small seedling. It'll look uh, empty, but you'll be amazed at how, fit, uh, how quickly it fills up. Um, Peppers need regular and sufficient water to produce well. Uh, this is not a drought tolerant, especially the, the bells, but even the hot peppers, you, you need to uh, keep the watering regular. They are subject to the same kind of uh, conditions because of irregular watering that tomatoes are subject to. And I'll show you pictures in a minute, okay? So do either stake them or cage them. Now, a lot of people say, you know, I've tried peppers. This is about bell peppers and other sweet peppers. 
I've tried them and tried them and I never get peppers. They just are little and they don't, they don't grow. They don't, I never get the big ones. So here is one thing that we have found. If the plant is not big enough to support a big pepper, you will never get a big pepper. And pepper plants tend to start putting on fruit, trying to set fruit way too soon. They're too small when they start trying to do that. So they're gonna bloom really early, especially buying plants in the, in the uh, nurseries. People are so happy. They say, oh, look, it's got blossoms already. I'm gonna have peppers really soon. Uh, so uh, you don't want to have peppers that soon. You want the plant to get strong first. So pinch off the blossoms. Uh, you know, Get your courage up and pinch off the blossoms. They're easy to find on the plant. You can see here a little pepper is trying to form. I would pinch off that pepper as well. Okay, so do that for at least, I would say four weeks and let that plant grow. Keep, the, keep it watered, keep it fertilized, check it every day or two and pinch off the blossoms. And you will find that when you let the peppers, find, let it finally start blooming and setting peppers, that you will in fact get big, wonderful, succulent peppers. And here, I'm not gonna name all these varieties, but here are just some of the colors of sweet and shapes and sizes of sweet, sweet peppers that you can grow. Um, they, you can pick it at the color that you like. This green pepper up here on the upper left is going to turn red eventually, but it will take a long time. So no reason not to use it as a green bell pepper along the way. Uh, it's all a matter of your taste and how long you can sustain delayed gratification waiting for them to ripen to full, full color. And these are a set of hot chilies, all, again, all different colors and shapes. Uh, and again, pick them when you want to use them, um, but if fully ripened, know what the color of your chili is when it's fully ripened. Um, I wanted to show you just briefly what tomato spotted wilt virus looks like on peppers. Again, I don't think there's any chance that you could confuse either of those peppers that you see there with something that's normal. Um, it's a very sad thing to see, but there it is. And then the leaf in this case is very different. So it is easy to diagnose it by looking at the leaf patterns of this virus. Again, notice the, the, the strange color variations and patterns that you see with when a virus has taken over a plant. Again, remove the plant if you see this on any of your ears. Uh, just to show you what blossom end rot and sun scald look like on peppers. So I mentioned these for tomatoes, it happens to peppers too. Blossom end rot is a dark spot that forms. It's not always right on the end, uh, but in this case, in this picture it is. And you can cut away on tomatoes and peppers, you can cut away the damaged part and use the rest of the pepper. But I would pick it right away when you see this kind of damage, whether it's sun scald or blossom end rot, because real rot can set into that pepper very easily because that wall has been breached. So may as well use it while it's green and still part of it being usable. Eggplants, the third member of this amazing family. So here are some of the shapes and colors. Uh, we do not have eggplant variety. I don't think we have a lot of pictures of eggplant varieties on the um, uh, website, but you can certainly look them up online and see, but they do come in greens and purples and whites. And there's even the yellows and oranges, but the yellows and oranges are known for their bitterness. Um, they're a different kind of, uh, different kettle of eggplant. So um, those might not be ones that you would be interested in for eating, uh, unless you really love bitter. So um, these eggplants uh, are like the peppers. They need real heat to be happy. And further, uh, they need to be a really good size seedling to be healthy in the garden for, because of a particular insect that I will talk about in a moment. So these are another don't plant until June one uh, and, and, and have a really good healthy large-ish seedling to put out there. They need regular generous water. Look at those fruits. Those are not going to form 
uh, if you're if you're uh, rationing water. They do beautifully in self-watering containers, which is a good indication of how much they need regular water. They really grow super well in self-watering containers. Um, they may need side dressing, as may your peppers uh, as well. Uh, most of us put enough fertilizer in the ground for our tomatoes that we don't side dress. Um, but if your plants seem to be stalling out, you can always try side dressing. A side dressing means adding fertilizer uh, by scratching it into the ground alongside the plants after the plants have already been growing for quite some time. But uh, eggplants and peppers really benefit from that. Uh, when you're picking these and picking peppers, clip them off. They don't uh, break off easily uh, as tomatoes do when they're ripe. And um, sometimes eggplants have thorns on their caps. So that's another reason to be careful when you're cutting them off. Uh, here are some more, uh, just to show you, they come in all sizes and all colors and shapes. Uh, the important thing is to pick them when they're still shiny. Don't have some preset notion of how big your eggplant should be for you to pick it. If you see that it's stopped enlarging, and if you're like me, you're gonna go out and look at them a lot. If it has stopped enlarging uh, for a few days to up, up to five, six days, and the, the shine, this is the shiniest picture of an eggplant I could uh, uh, find for you. The shine is um, starting to change. That's the time to pick it. Baby eggplants, Small eggplants are delicious. Eggplants that have gone past prime are not delicious. They are seedy and they start to get bitter. So when you harvest an eggplant, those seeds should barely be visible in it. Uh, so uh, don't go for what you see in the grocery store, go for what your plant is producing. Harvest when it's still shiny and it's stopped enlarging. This is the insect that I promised to mention. This is why you want your eggplant seedlings to be big and healthy when you put them out. This is a very tiny insect. It's called a flea beetle. It is about the size of a flea, maybe a tiny bit bigger, but I think it's about the size. And it jumps like a flea when it's disturbed. So that's why it's called a flea beetle. But it is a be beetle and it chews those tiny holes in the leaves that you see in that picture. So you hardly ever see the insects because they jump when you disturb the plant. So you might look at those holes and think, what on earth is eating my eggplant leaves? They can actually destroy a small seedling very easily. And by that, I mean a seedling that's only four inches tall and, and its leaves are only like two to three inches. I actually grow my eggplants all the way up to gallon containers to avoid this insect destroying them. You can also try to seal it out with row cover. Uh, it's way too small to, if, if you have any opening, uh, it will manage to get in there. You can't do it with netting, obviously. So um, my advice is to uh, grow a big, healthy seedling and put those out. The, these beetles overwinter in your garden in the debris in the garden beds. So this is another reason to clean up your garden. Uh, if you have them some year, that especially that year, clean up and remove the mulch, compost it if it's compostable, but get it out of your garden and use clean mulch the next year. Spider mites are also a problem on eggplant. Those big non-waxy leaves, the, the leaves are kind of fuzzy on the surface. They don't have any wax or anything to protect them from dehydration. Spider mites you were told about before and saw pictures of, they, um, they are sucking insects. So all those zillions of little tiny white spots that you see on that leaf on the right uh, have been, are, is where the leaf has been decolorized because the mite is sucking the contents out of the cell. So um, they are favored by dry, dusty conditions. And so if you see them starting, if you see your eggplant leaves looking like they're starting to get those white dots, 
Uh, you can turn the leaf over and see if you can actually shake the mites off. If you turn the leaf over and hold a sheet of white paper below it and swat it a little bit, some mites will be knocked onto the paper. And on white paper, you'll be able to see these teeny little dots racing around on the paper. Uh, so that would be a sign that you have spider mites. You can wash them off with water. And if you keep the plants free of dust because eggplants have that um, kind of fuzzy surface, they really collect dust even if we can't see it. So uh, mites love to take advantage of that. So wash them off frequently to keep the populations down. And rats, yet again, uh, they really love our summer garden. And you can see here that kind of uh, neat uh, curving away uh, chewing pattern that is very typical of rats. Squirrels get blamed for a lot of what rats do. Uh, squirrels do enough damage on their own. They also eat tomatoes. Uh, they eat squash also. So uh, they're in there, but um, rats are nocturnal. And so we tend to forget that they can be uh, a real problem in the garden. Okay. The last member of the Solanaceae, fam Solanaceae family that we're going to talk about is potatoes. Um, they are in that same family with uh, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. And um, we just wanted to mention them. Now is the time to plant. In fact, we could have, we can plant usually, a lot of us think of St. Patrick's Day as the day that we plant potatoes. Um, and you can plant even a slightly earlier than that, but they are frost sensitive. So they are a summer plant. That is, we do not grow them into the winter. Uh, the plants will not stand uh, cold weather. Um, they have many of the same pests and diseases as tomatoes and eggplants and so forth. They're subject to flea beetle, for example. Um, but um, they are uh, not, they are pretty carefree in our garden. So you can see some chewing on this. This one is from Purdue, so it's not from here, but you can see some small holes. And they're really different in how they're planted. We plant small potatoes that are sold as seed potatoes. You can buy certified seed potatoes uh, from suppliers online. Uh, and sometimes they also have them in nurseries, but although they don't have the variety selection that you will find online. Uh, I do uh, recommend that you plant certified seed potatoes rather than planting grocery store tomatoes, but potatoes because those potatoes are not certified disease-free. And so you could be introducing some kind of potato disease into your garden that it will later be a problem. Uh, also, sometimes, not always, I don't think they do this with organic potatoes, but um, they sometimes treat potatoes to prevent them from sprouting or to delay them from sprouting. And uh, that can mean that they don't perform very well as seed potatoes in your garden. I think it's worth it to buy it, but of course, as I said, gardening's about experimenting. So uh, you can use uh, potatoes uh, and just plant the whole potato or pieces of the potato that you have cut uh, so that each one has about three of these eyes, what we call the eyes of the potato, because that's where a stem is going to emerge once this is buried in the soil. And that stem will send out roots. And um, that's uh, how we grow potatoes. We bur bury them. We have in very thorough instructions about growing potatoes on the web. So I am not gonna go over that information here. As you can see, time is flying. Um, so uh, one thing you need to know, this is kind of a diagram of what it looks like with all those wonderful potatoes growing down there. So they grow off, all of them are above the seed potato. So wherever you put that potato in the ground, all your potatoes that you're going to harvest are going to be above it. So we keep burying the plants under mulch. And that's where that whole idea comes from of hilling up potatoes. The more you hill it up, the more territory you give that plant to um, form potatoes. And notice that there are a lot of stems from one potato because every eye, every eye will produce a stem. Digging them is just heavenly, especially if you have kids or grandkids, uh, they are gonna love going through the dirt and finding those potatoes. And you can, you can just sneak in, sneak your hands in 
and find some potatoes and pull them out of the ground uh, without digging the whole plant. You can do that for a while, but at some point you're gonna to wanna to dig the whole thing up and harvest it. And again, thorough instructions on the web for how to do that. Beans, we have just two vegetables to go here and one of them is beans. So um, there are bush beans, which um, are pretty sturdy and don't have to be supported. Uh, They'll, they'll tend to flop a little bit and some of them will tend to wind around a little bit, but they're okay. And you see those on the left there, they don't get very tall. And then there are pole beans that will grow and grow and grow like Jack and the Beanstalk. And they need to be supported on a trellis. Here, there are trellis we just tied together for one by ones. Uh, and you spread the legs out and you put them in place before you plant the beans. Uh, just as we said with the cages that you were putting around uh, other vegetables. By the way, I do cage eggplants because the eggplants are so heavy. It helps keep those plants nice and supported. Okay, so um, three or four beans around each foot of that teepee and they will grow. You do not have to train them. They will find that pole and go up it so fast you, you'll just be amazed. So pole beans take longer to start producing, but they produce longer. And they're like indeterminate tomatoes. They produce their tomatoes, they produce their beans over a, a, a longer period of time. Bush beans tend to put most of their beans on right away and they're all available or a very large number of them are available all at the same time. Again, a great thing if what you want to do is, um, is can or freeze or, or um, preserve the beans somehow. Um, bush beans do sometimes have a second crop, a lighter crop later too. So usually leave the plants in until you can see if they're going to rebloom and give you more beans, but you do have to watch them. And beans are tough task master, masters. You have to pick them and pick them and pick them. They will stop producing if you don't pick them. So you have to keep up with them every other day is about as much time off as you get from bean picking once they start to produce. Beans surprise people in how much warmth they need. Um, I say June 1st for putting bean seeds into the ground. It's because of the soil temperature. They need the soil to be warm or they will rot in the soil. And part of our climate here in the Bay Area is that the soil and the soil being clay the soil doesn't warm up the way it does in the middle of Arkansas. So um, beans, uh, better off waiting, so easy to go from seed. You do not need to uh, grow seedlings. And I, frankly, I think the plants are stronger if you grow them by planting the seed directly in the ground as long as you wait until the soil is warm enough. This is what spider mites do to beans. They also are very susceptible. Again, it's not a waxy leaf. It's, it's a very uh, soft, uncoated leaf. And so the spider mites are, are very attracted to it. And again, trying to avoid dusty, uh, dry conditions is um, one of the best hedges against spider mites. So spray them down uh, in order to try to keep the mites down. Uh, this, Louise showed you this picture before. This is what bean leaves look like when mites, zillions of mites have been sucking on, uh, taking out the uh, juices from those cells. And here is what a virus looks like on beans. So again, you see the puckered leaves, a strange shape, not like a nice flat bean leaf like it's supposed to be. And then the mottled coloration on the right. So there are viruses that affect beans and you will, want to, um, you will want to remove those plants so that that virus doesn't spread around your, your garden. This is one insect that is, can be a problem for beans. I wanted to show you stink bugs because I, I mentioned them earlier uh, with regard to the stinging of the tomato. Um, the one that is very common in our garden is the color, colorful one that's on the left there, harlequin bugs. But you will see these green ones. They don't build up to the numbers that the colorful one uh, does uh, usually, but um, they're all shaped like your fingernail, and they're, which is unusual for a bug. They call them shield shaped, but I like to say they're shaped like a fingernail. 
and they um, the ones on these these colorful guys are about the size and shape of your little fingernail. I know you all have different size fingernails, but you know take that as a as a measure. They're not real big, but they're very noticeable because that's big for an insect, and they're very brightly colored, <clears throat> and they are sucking insects. So as I mentioned for the tomatoes. So this is what an, a set of eggs, stink bug eggs looks like and the hatch. These are all teeny little uh, uh, stink bugs and they are of the brown marmorated stink bug which is a potentially very bad pest for us. Keep a lookout for it. It's bigger than many of our stink bugs but not very big, maybe as big as your middle finger fingernail. But see those banded antennae that's how you know you have a brown marmorated stink bug. If you find those, call the master gardeners and they will tell you that how to inform the ag commissioner in our garden. They want to know where this insect is building up in our garden, in our, in our county. And this is the egg, uh, that's a repeat picture, but the uh, babies uh, just hatched and eggs of the harlequin bug, which is this colorful one called the harlequin bug. And um, if you find a egg, a, a, an array of eggs like that, you can see down below, uh, it's very geometric until the <laughs> insects start coming out. Um, if you find that kind of geometric array, uh, destroy those eggs. Uh, because those are going to hatch out into a zillion little stink bugs. And these, these do have some predators, including some parasites. Remember the parasites we talked about with aphids that lay their egg in the living aphid? Well, there is a, there is a parasite that lays its eggs, it lays its eggs in the eggs of the stink bug. And that's what you see in the bottom picture. The reason those eggs are black and dark gray and changing color instead of being white is that they have been parasitized. So if you find an array of eggs, stink bug eggs like that, and by the way, that whole array was just about a half an inch across. That's the size of it. On the underside of the leaf for protection is where they're laid. If you find one that's darkening like that, don't destroy it because what will hatch out of that is a zillion of those little wasps that will go on and kill other stink bugs. This is the last uh, vegetable slide and the last vegetable that we are gonna talk about. And we just put it in here because um, they're in certain uh, parts of the world. This is a much prized vegetable. And I happen to love this vegetable. And I think it's the most beautiful vegetable plant that you can put in your garden. This is okra. Uh, it is in the hibiscus family. You can tell that by looking at that flower on the left side. And the plants are beautiful. This happens to be a variety that has red stems and red veins in the leaves and produces red okra. And it is, which are you see growing there. Uh, that is the seed pod of the plant that will come out of the center of that flower. Uh, and uh, it is just, if you like okra, um, I, I urge you to try it. Know that we need one of our hottest, in the Bay Area, we need our very hottest summer for this to succeed. This is a super heat lover. The, the okra that's grown in California is grown in Imperial County, which is on the Mexican border of our state, east of San Diego. Half the days of the year in Imperial County are over 90 degrees. And many of the days it gets to 120 there. That's where okra wants to be. So we clearly do not have that climate here, but if we have a warm uh, summer, we will get some okra. It takes a long time for the plants to start to producing. Uh, the, uh, the quickest is 40 days. And my recommendation would be that you do not plant the seeds out. I, I would recommend that you plant seedlings, that you start your own seedlings because it's rare to find them, although I have occasionally found them in, in nurseries, um, that you start your own seedlings and that you have them be at least six weeks old on June 1st. And that you not plant them out even on June 1st 
unless it's a really nice warm period of time. Because I've had the seedlings fail even in early June, if it happened to be a summer uh, that wasn't warming up as quickly as usual. So uh, don't be discouraged. It's not you, <laughs> it's the weather. It's very marginal here for okra, but oh, it's just wonderful if you succeed and you get a nice crop of okra. So uh, it can take up to 70 days for some varieties from transplanting date, 70 days to start producing okra. So uh, by that time we're in our hottest months, August and uh, September is really a very hot month for us too. So you will get some, but you, you have to be patient and you have to have a good year. Okay, I think I am at the end. I wanna thank you for joining us. We have a few minutes here for questions. Um, we do have a um, assignment for next week and this will be on the uh, website in the same place but I will leave it up here while we're answering questions so that uh, those of you who wanna take a, a picture of it or, or read through it can do that. Excellent, thank you so much, Candace. This is terrific. We have a few follow-up questions on verticillium and fusarium. So okay. maybe we could start there. Great. So will the two disorders affect the taste of a tomato or edibility of a tomato? No, but what they will do is reduce the foliage on the plant and it, 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 it creeps up um, so that the tomatoes that are on the plant are not getting the nutrition. Remember the foliage is where the magic happens. That's where all the, the uh, good stuff is, uh, is created. Uh, that's where, uh, where it receives the sunlight and, and uh, synthesizes the materials that need to go into that tomato in order to be, um, uh, in order for it to mature and, and live up to its potential. So if, you, if the foliage on the plant is compromised, the, that whole process is compromised. So the, the tomatoes will um, possibly be affected if it's a very late version or if you have a really bad early case. Um, the disease itself does not affect the tomato. The other thing that will happen is that sunburn will start being very hard to prevent as you lose foliage on the plant. So uh, those beautiful tomatoes are going to get uh, damaged by sun scald. Yeah, and then what other plants are susceptible to verticillium and fusarium? So Amy was asking, should she, what should she rotate with? So okay. should she rotate with peppers, beets? Uh, so all the Solanaceae plants are susceptible. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes, uh, uh, tomatillos, all of those are susceptible. Now there are, and there are many other plants that are susceptible. Um, uh, squash, the squash family, the cucurbit family that you're gonna hear about next week, I believe is not susceptible. Um, beans, I don't think are susceptible. Um, so it's mainly this other Solanaceae vegetables that are, um, that are uh, subject to it. And um, okay. there are different types of verticillium and fusarium that might affect other vegetables in the garden, but they're not common in our gardens. Uh, basil is very much affected by fusarium. Basil, the herb basil. Interesting. Yeah. So how do you prevent new soil? So if somebody's gone out and, you know, freshly purchased soil, how do you prevent these diseases from getting into the soil in the future? Well, if you have freshly, uh, if you have new soil that was brought in, let's hope it doesn't have it in it. <laughs> uh, so the question is where it came from, uh, where you got the soil. And if it's, if it's potting soil, it doesn't have it, you know, because that's not soil. Uh, so containers and so forth, you don't have to worry about. If it's a soil mix or a topsoil blend that you got when in, in your uh, when your house was built or something like that, um, you you might not know. Uh, you can ask them, how do I know this is disease free? 
um, you're having to test it would be um, very expensive. You don't, don't wanna have to do that. They should be able to guarantee it's disease free. So how do you keep it from getting it? Well, we all share a lot from our gardens, right? We dig up plants and we give them to friends because they want to grow that same plant. Um, that is a way that we bring soil, any way that you bring soil from somebody else's garden into your garden is a potential way to bring in soil-borne diseases or soil, soil-borne pests like nematodes. So um, if you wanna be sure you never get it, I think that's, that's pretty uh, extreme, um, but that's what you would have to do. You would have to never bring in soil from another site unless you knew that to be disease-free as well. Okay. And then some people are saying their tomato plants begin to look like they have russet mites toward the end of the season. How do they tell whether it's just kind of the end of the season or it's russet mites? If it's russet mite, it is not going to be just at the end of the season. They're going to get on that plant when it's growing uh, and as it grows. So they're going to be coming out of the soil. Uh, you're not going to see them because they're way too tiny, but they're going to come out and live their life cycle, reproducing and everything on that plant, starting from, you know, within uh, a few weeks of the time that, that, well, actually, you don't see it until the plant is, is looking pretty healthy. So I'd say when my tomatoes are about three feet tall is when you might start seeing browning leaves here and there. So the question then is, is that just a leaf that's been on that plant a long time? Or is that russet mite or is that fusarium or verticillium? It can drive you kind of crazy <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on with your tomato leaves. But if it's an odd leaf here and there, it's not russet mite. Um, it could just be an old leaf. You know, the very oldest leaves that were on the plant, they're going to die sometime. But if you see like this entire, like a horde of something is, which is what is happening, coming up and browning the leaves as they go, that is a good sign that it's russet mite. If you see a branch suddenly, yellow, and then start to dehydrate, that could be verticillium. So those are some, some things to watch for, but there isn't any perfect way. And at the end of the season, you are going to have brown leaves. This is now an old spent plant. So don't worry about brown leaves at the end of the season. If you're still watering, if you've cut off the water because you're intensifying the flavor, definitely you're gonna get brown leaves faster. Uh, but if you're still watering, uh, it just means leaves are dying. The, the conditions are, have changed, the plant's getting old. And, and if we could follow up on that, cutting back on water. So there were some follow-up questions about how much water to cut back. Um, and would you do, what types of tomatoes would you cut back water on to intensify flavor? <laughs> Uh, you are asking the wrong person because I consider it a form of torture <laughs> for tomato plants <laughs> to get back on water. Um, I would suggest that if you have that question, um, you hold it for next week because I think we're going to have sort of a panel approach to questions next week at the end of the class. And I'm sure that there are some advocates of cutting back on water at the end of the season who could give you a really good answer to that. Failing that, you could ask the help desk that. I've, you could ask them. I've heard that you can cut back water at the end of, you know, after the tomatoes are on the plant and cut back water to enrich the flavor. How much do I really do that? Ask that question of help desk. Okay, I'm sorry, everybody. We're not gonna get to all these questions, but, but a couple of people asked, so the nurseries now have seedlings and some of our, some of our participants here have already bought seedlings, um, but they're hearing they shouldn't plant them yet. What should they do with what they've bought? Okay, I would, um, if, if it's already a, a seedling that's quite large for the four inch pot, you can carefully knock it out of the pot and look at the root ball. If it's really, if the roots are really filling that pot, I would suggest you pot it up into the next size larger pot. Now this is gonna make, uh, planting it uh, a little, uh, you're going to have to dig a, a, a bigger hole. 
But uh, even if you ended up planting into gallon pots, you could do trench planting. Uh, so it, you, you have some strategies now for what to do if you have a very large seedling. Better to pot it up into the next size pot and gain a couple more weeks with a healthy plant that you haven't stalled than to plant it early and, and maybe have it be too cold out there. Um, in any given year, you might get away with planting it now. And I can tell you that there are lots of people that are out there saying, I've already planted them, they're fine. You know, I plant them every year on March 15th and they're fine. That's true. I mean, people do have success with these. Um, we're trying to give you the best chance for success with, with our advice. Um, but, you know, gardening is about trying things. So I would suggest potting them up you could put them out in the garden along with other gardeners who have probably done that. Just because plants are in the nursery does not mean it's time to plant them into your garden. The nurseries are there to maximize getting plants into your hands. Well, and I'm a strong proponent of potting up. So I keep <laughs> a bunch of gallon pots around for when I can't resist them in the nursery and bring them home. And <laughs> Just pot them up until they're ready to go out. I'm sorry, everybody. That's all the time we have for tonight. So please see the Santa Clara County Master Gardener website, mgsantaclara.ucanr.edu for additional information. Just click on vegetables and you'll find more information there. Thank you, Candace, for a wonderful, another wonderful presentation. I wanna thank our behind the scenes team of Karen, Lisa and Louise who are helping to answer more of these questions. Um, thanks to all of you for attending and again, for your interest in vegetable gardening. We hope to see you same again next week, same time, same place for session eight, our last session, more on warm season vegetables. And meanwhile, take care, stay safe and happy gardening everybody.